Hey guys and girls, a little while back I did a video on home PC based flight sims versus real world flying. It ended up getting posted to some flight sim forums and surprisingly to me anyway became one of my more popular and controversial videos. Admittedly, with only an hour of flight time under my belt at the time, I was taking kind of a high level view of things. Though ironically it was mostly the simmers and not the real world pilots in my comments who had some issues with the video. Well, I've got a lot more actual flight time at this point. I've also had the chance to try out a level D A320 simulator. That's what airlines train their actual right, pilots on. Pitch up. A little bit of left rudder. Hold that, hold that. A little bit of and I've taken rudder. some of the suggestions from the simmers in my comments and tried out some new things on my own PC. As you can see here, I've also kitted out my setup with some new gear. So today, let's revisit the subject and see if maybe I just got it wrong. Maybe consumer PC sims really can help you learn to fly. There's really a lot to unpack here, so let's just get started. Before we even begin, just a quick preemptive update. As I was editing this video, Microsoft dropped their surprise announcement of the next release of Microsoft Flight Simulator. It looks awesome, and it's definitely a day one purchase for me. But I'm pretty confident that 90% of what I say in this video will apply to it too. Hopefully you'll see why as the video moves along. And now, back to it. First, let's talk about what flying and learning to do it really means. We all know that when you pull back on the stick, the plane goes up. Push forward, the plane goes down. Afterburner gives you the real dogfight excitement of the arcade version. Yeah. Like barrel rolls, nose dives, supersonic speed. Hey, congratulations, you know how to fly. On a very basic level, that's even kind of true. The very first lesson you take, that's pretty much what the instructor is going to have you do. So you've all but gotten your pilot's license, right? Well, pilots do have a joke that planes fly by PFM. I'll leave it up to you to look that up. But in reality, getting even just your private pilot's license means learning the aerodynamics behind various maneuvers, some of which are pretty counterintuitive, being able to control those maneuvers to within certain tolerances, being able to plan cross-country flights accurately and then flying them without getting lost during both day and night, and generally knowing the rules of the road so you can fly safely in any airspace you're allowed to fly in and at both towered and non-towered airports. Flying is also almost boring in how procedural it is, even in small planes. We use checklists for basically any situation, and a whole lot of flight training is just practicing those checklists developing muscle memory and an understanding of why each item is on a given list. For example, in an engine fire on the ground, what's the second thing you do? Turn off the cabin heat. And the third? Believe it or not, throttle up to full power. Would you think to do either of those things if your car engine caught fire? So pilots need to understand why we do them so it just becomes a logical step in the literal heat of the moment. If you're wondering, the first thing you do is turn off the fuel selector. And of course, beyond the private pilot's license, there's a whole other world of instrument flying, which has its own rules. Then high performance, complex aircraft with more powerful engines and retractable landing gear. And finally, multi-engine planes that have their own unique considerations. All the while, we're dealing with air traffic control, flight service stations, and other pilots in the air. The flying environment in much of the United States, and indeed the world, is way more crowded than you probably realize. General aviation planes gather like a swarm of gnats around most regional airports, while airliners often occupy the space above them. And as a pilot, you have to know where you are in 3D space at all times. For many of us, there is never a time when you're that mythical lone pilot enjoying the silence and serenity of flying high above the earth. Instead, it's more like a cacophony, and for me at least, learning to deal with this busy environment has been the hardest part of my training. United 2304, wind 280 at 10, runway 1 right, waiting for the delta to clear, and you are cleared for takeoff. Tower United 2304, we just got worse than the flight attendant, but I got up and went to the restroom. Oh, that's a terrible time for that. 2304, cancel takeoff, sir, and hold in position and get them back in their seats. Oh, they're in the seat, it's not the right one. <laughs> okay, Korean 026 Heavy, cross to a left, cross to a right, turn right on Charlie. Under the stress of busy airspace and just trying to control my plane, my radio calls are often awkward, stilted, and missing information. 
Every so often I'll miss a call from the tower or approach controller. Once I forgot to close my flight plan, almost leading to the flight service station sending out search and rescue, at my expense. Communications is both one of the most important things to learn as a pilot, and not just for me, but for many others too, also one of the most difficult. So out of all this, what are flight sims good at simulating, and in what ways are they just video games? What can you realistically learn in your own home from a flight sim like X-Plane, or as I used in my last video, MS Flight Simulator or Prepared? And can they really help you in real life training? Well, as you can see here, I've upgraded my setup with three monitors, two iPads, and dedicated controls for added realism. I also have an Oculus Rift because X-Plane does now support VR, one of my wish list items last time around. But it's a little problematic in ways I'll talk about in a bit. All this is meant to give me as close to a true cockpit feel as I can afford, while at least not screwing up my muscle memory for when I get back in a real plane. The point is, I've gone all in on this, at least to the extent that I personally can. I'm giving flight sims the best possible shot, because anything that could potentially help me in my training is a good thing. Let's talk about what flight sims do well, or at least can do well. Number one, procedures. Probably the best use of any flight sim is practicing your normal and even some emergency procedures and checklists, and using airport, departure, and arrival diagrams. Just getting going in a real plane involves about seven different checklists, and sitting there running through them all multiple times in a sim can really help you feel more comfortable and get through them faster and more accurately in real life. Using diagrams can also help you learn the airport layout, so you're not making wrong turns and getting yelled at by ground control. This happens a lot. Some checklists also need to be memorized. I know, kind of seems to defeat the purpose, right? And practicing these in a sim is a big help there too. For example, in an engine failure, you need to just know what to do and do it. There's no time to open a book and read a checklist. You can even really turn off your engine in a sim to see what happens, which at least in the early stages, we'd never do in real life. Number two, graphics. I know I harped on how bad MSFS looks these days in my last video. X-Plane looks better, but by default it's still actually borderline useless for realistic VFR flying. It honestly doesn't matter how high you turn up the settings. Visual flying isn't as random as it may seem. We use specific visual waypoints to navigate, and the waypoints that exist on sectional charts just aren't usually in X-Plane at all. But several commenters on that earlier video turned me on to Ortho for XP, which gives you satellite imagery and properly placed road and river overlays that make it possible to navigate in the game just as you can in real life. Objects are all flat, so you can't use a particularly tall building or tower as a waypoint if it's not actually modeled in the game or in any other custom scenery, but you can usually see what you need to see at higher altitudes. You actually can then use the sim to practice realistic cross-country navigation. Ortho for XP isn't all that intuitive, and I still have to rewatch tutorial videos every time I want to add a new geographical tile to my sim. But it is at least possible to get visuals in the sim that match real life, more or less. Number three, instrument flying. Now, I'm just starting the instrument rating part of my training, so it's possible I'm putting this in the wrong category. But from what I've been able to do, and from what I've read from others more advanced than me, IFR flying in X-Plane is at least basically realistic. You can use real airways, standard instrument departures and arrivals, of course VORs and other nav aids, and you'll be vectored around realistically by air traffic control. I can't wait to get more into this, because this is when you start to do the stuff that airline pilots actually do most of the time. Now let's see what sims do poorly or not at all. Number one, the air traffic environment. I talked about how important communications is, and there's really no sim that models this well at all out of the box, or even any add-on that can make things truly realistic. FS-10 actually has a half-decent attempt at simulated ATC, and it's a little-known fact that you actually can force it to use standard procedures, just request another approach if you're being vectored. With a good package of AI traffic, it can start to feel realistically busy. But there's still a lot missing, and you can't force the built-in ATC to use standard procedures for AI traffic, only for you. It's also just so freaking slow. 
X-Plane's built-in ATC is even worse, and I don't use it for VFR flying. There's no way to do anything without filing a flight plan. There's no real AI traffic. Unlike FS-10, X-Plane does not treat other planes as actual objects, so they're not persistent. So even with an AI traffic package, planes don't have real flights that you can shadow all the way to their destination. They just kind of gather like flies around airports. VATSIM and Pilot Edge try to fix some of these shortcomings. These are online add-ons that add real people to the mix. But VATSIM doesn't use real frequencies, and its controllers and pilots are not professionally trained, so the quality varies a lot, and it's not going to give you the experience of memorizing frequencies and realistically changing them during flight. Pilot Edge was specifically developed for training purposes, and does have some FAA-trained controllers who will actually yell at you if you don't use proper terminology or procedures. But I found that the airports I fly out of aren't really represented well, and the controllers can be downright surly. Usually real-life controllers are pretty friendly and understanding of student pilots. The Pilot Edge controllers expect everyone to be a pro. Number two, the physical environment. There's not that much that sims can do about this, but the physical sensations of real-life flying make it much more challenging than flying a sim anchored to a non-moving floor. Small planes especially are subject to the whims of moving air much more so than airliners, and there is near constant turbulence. Thermals can suddenly push your plane higher by hundreds of feet, downdrafts can do the opposite, and the constant bumpiness and sudden rise and fall of either wing can make just flying straight and level and even properly reading your instruments a challenge. Every sim lets you adjust the weather or select real-world conditions, but these are never a match for real life. I've tried real-world weather in X-Plane right after actually flying through it. There's something about the sharpness, violence, and randomness of constantly moving air that sims just can't reproduce. And of course, they can't fool your inner ear into feeling the plane moving around, which is hugely important for real-world instrument training. Pilots are trained in weather to the point of being miniature meteorologists. It's that important of a subject for pilots, and sims just don't do it well. There are add-ons that can make it look better, but the feel is something different. Now, I'll talk a little about X-Plane's VR mode here, because it is trying to make you feel more like you're in a real plane. And it is actually pretty cool to feel like you're sitting in a real cockpit, especially if you have Ortho for XP installed. It does actually look pretty close to the real thing, if you were nearsighted and forgot your glasses. In other words, it's pretty blurry, but still visually impressive. The real problem is, how do you interact with the controls? As you can see here, I'm sort of alternating between the Rift's touch controllers and my own throttles, but of course I can't see any of them, so I'm always kind of fumbling around. Lastly, there's no real way to check a sectional chart, nav log, or multiple checklists in VR. The most I figured out that you can have is one. So VR is fun, but as a training aid, eh, it's actually kind of terrible, at least for now better to just use a multi-monitor setup. Number three, aircraft flight dynamics. This is probably at least somewhat down to individual planes and their modelers, but I fly the Diamond DA-40, and the best one I could find for X-Plane is, shall we say, barely close. I've gone into the Sims plane maker and checked the specs, and they all match the real plane, which makes me suspect that it's something in the Sim itself that's not right. X-Plane is known for its realistic flight model, but several maneuvers that have to be mastered in real life to get your private pilot's license just can't be done with the DA-40 I found and purchased. For example, the simulated plane just will not stall realistically at any speed. I've gotten it to slow down to 45 knots in a power-on stall, and the nose just stays up. It drops like a leaf, which the real plane just doesn't do. It noses or wings over hard and drops more like a lawn dart. Number four, aircraft ground dynamics. This is one area where FS-10 is clearly superior to X-Plane, but neither is great. Taxiing, takeoff, and landing rollout are all among the most dangerous parts of flight. You probably don't realize it, but a lot of accidents happen in these phases. At the airline I'm training for, first officers aren't even allowed to touch the tiller and taxi the airplane. Only captains are allowed to do it, because there's so much risk of getting stuck in the mud hitting and damaging a sign or light post, or even other airplanes. Sims don't really model any of that properly, and the general feel of taxiing around on the ground is much floatier and lighter than it is in real life. Real planes just feel heavier, even small ones. 
they bang around on the ground, they have a lot of mass and momentum, and they're hard to get going and even harder to stop. Planes float all over the taxiway in X-Plane, but it's almost too easy to correct and in fact overcorrect if you get going in the wrong direction. Takeoffs and landings are similar. While things like torque and p-factor are supposedly modeled in all the major sims, they just don't feel or act right. Usually in a sim, you'll take off straight down the runway without issue. If you do start to veer off, a simple rudder correction will put you back dead straight because your wheels are in firm contact with the ground until liftoff. But this is not the way reality works. As you gain speed, you come into ground effect and your wings begin generating lift almost immediately. That progressively takes weight off the wheels as you travel down the runway, with not a lot of grip remaining by about halfway through your takeoff roll. At that point, the combination of gyroscopic effects, torque, p-factor, and whatever crosswind component you have can conspire to literally push you off the runway, while ground effect wants you airborne before you have enough lift to stay in the air. Full rudder is often needed, and the plane does not stay pointed straight when that happens. You'll be crabbed and almost skidding down the runway centerline, although not really because your tires aren't doing much of anything anymore. It is an odd feeling, but you have to stay there until reaching rotation speed, at which point most small airplanes will almost take off by themselves. One of the hardest things I had to learn was to just barely pull back on the stick and do it smoothly, because the airplane is basically flying along the ground already and the gathering speed is enough in itself to put you in the air. The plane wants to go up at that point if you just let it. It's a feel thing, and no sim can replicate it. Number five, they teach bad habits. Look at the default view most people have when they fire up a PC flight sim. This has gotten better over the years, but still the only view you have outside is through a thin sliver of window. This is true regardless of what plane you choose to fly. This is basically the exact opposite of real life and the opposite of what you're supposed to see. All through the private pilot's license training, you will be taught to look outside, not at your instruments. My instructor told me straight out, stop playing that video game down there and look outside. VFR flying is about seeing and being seen, and with other air traffic being mostly a non-factor in sims, it's easy to get into the habit of just staring at those needles and numbers down below. That's just one example. One thing I've had a hard time adjusting to is the precision required when flying for real and that's despite the increased difficulty of controlling a real plane. Sims can make you feel like a super pilot, even when, by any objective standard, you are flying like a total ass. Crossed in front of an active parallel runway on final approach, but greased your landing? A sim will make you feel like a god for that, when in real life you'd be dragged in front of the FAA for a pilot deviation. There are no consequences for mistakes and poor flying in a sim, so it's very easy to think you're flying like Captain Sully when you're really flying more like Captain Suck. I think the most important way sims fall short is just that they can't possibly hope to model all the forces acting simultaneously on an airplane. Computers are digital. The best they can do is model a sample of all those forces, and given the computing power available in modern PCs, they can't really model many of those samples. But real planes are analog. There are a variety of forces acting in different ways and in different directions all over every single aircraft surface all the time. A home PC just can't hope to really replicate how a plane acts or feels. It's not even really a criticism of PCs. It's just where we are in computing power. We've come a long way over the 30 some odd years of PC flight sims, but we've still got a long, long way to go. If you're wondering how the big professional sims do it, well, they use many computers linked together, and most of these are purpose-built for a specific type of processing. They have many, many more times the computing power of your home PC. Home PCs will get there, but it's gonna be a while. And when they do, are you also gonna spring for a full hydraulically operated cockpit setup to go with your fancy Ryzen 25 CPU? You're still gonna be missing the environment. But back to the basic question, can a PC flight sim help you really learn to fly? Well, yes, it can. If you use it right and beware of bad habits. Go into it knowing that planes in consumer flight sims, and that includes X-Plane, fly nothing like real life, and you can still use them to supplement your training. Use them to practice procedures and memorize checklists, to familiarize yourself with airports and terrain, with ortho for XP, and to work with nav aids. 
Just don't expect them to teach you stick and rudder skills, or how to talk to a controller without sounding like a total dork. Well, that's it for now. Until next time, bye bye